My name is Bill Sewell. Uh, I am uh, an emeritus professor of political science and history uh, here at the University of Chicago. Um, and I want to welcome all of you to this uh, book salon. Uh, we're celebrating a book by, uh, by Colin Jones called The Fall of Robespierre, 24 Hours in Revolutionary Paris. And there it is. Uh, there's a picture of Robespierre on the ground with his head being held up uh, after his uh, meeting with the executioner. Um, this book salon is, uh, is co-sponsored by the Chicago Center for, for uh, Contemporary Theory um, and also the Seminary Co-op Bookstore. Um, I uh, hope all of you will run to the Seminary Co-op Bookstore and buy copies of this book uh, once uh, this event is over. Uh, so let me turn it over to Paul Cheney who will be chairing uh, the event. And thank you, Bill. Um, and thank you to those of you for inviting me to um, you know, preside over this and also give a comment. So I just want to briefly introduce um, Bill and, and Colin, and then Colin will give a, a just short summary of, of his book. And then Bill and I will each uh, give a, a comment and we will ask some questions. Uh, Colin Jones is an emeritus professor of history at Queen Mary University of London. Since 2017, he's been a visiting professor of history here at the University of Chicago um, and thrilling so many students with his wonderful courses. Um, he's the author of so many books, The Smile Revolution in 18th Century Paris, which is, um, it actually, it makes dentistry interesting and not as painful as one might expect. Um, the Great Nation, France from Louis XIV to Napoleon, um, a book about Versailles, and also uh, Paris, Biography of a City. And this book, The Fall of Robespierre, has recently been shortlisted for one of the UK's most foremost literary prizes for nonfiction, the Duff Cooper Prize. Also, the book you should look in the issue, the, I think the next issue of the New York Review of Books the book will be reviewed. And our first commentator, as he mentioned, Bill Sewell, is the Frank P. Pitson Distinguished Service Professor, Emeritus of Political Science and History. He's so well known to all of us that, you know, I probably don't need to introduce him, but just I'll say that he's the author of Work and Revolution, I mean, among other books, Work and Revolution, the rhetoric of bourgeois revolution, the Abbe CS, and what is the third estate? A book of essays, uh, widely read, called Logics of History, Social Theory and Social Transformation. And most recently, and also the subject of a 3CT uh, book roundtable, Capitalism and the Emergence of Civic Equality in 18th Century France. So I guess he has his bona fides to uh, uh, comment on this book. He's also, I should note, a, a founding editor of Critical Historical Studies. I'm not sure, Bill, how, how many years it's been in publication, but it's been- uh, I think uh, nine. I think we're doing, starting volume nine this year. Okay, but it, it's very quickly become a quite important uh, journal uh, in, in, in many different fields. I, I thought I'd just flag that. Uh, so I guess I'll hand it over to Colin, who's just gonna, gonna give you a little I've had to see the book in a few Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Bill, um, Paul, and the sponsors of this evening. I'm delighted to be here and talking about my, my recent book, uh, The Fall of Robespierre. And uh, I thought, um, obviously, many of you will know about it. You'll know who Robespierre is and what, which day we're talking about uh, on which he fell, but uh, many won't. So I'll just give a very brief indication of what it's about, essentially. Um, so if you were going to tell the um, French Revolution, the history of the French Revolution in four days, you would do it thus. You would say, uh, first of all, there's the 14th of July, 1789. It's the day when everyone says the revolution began, essentially. Um, uh, and it was the Bastille was stormed, et cetera, et cetera. But probably to put, give it uh, the terminal date, would say the 18th of Brumaire in 1799. Uh, the day when Napoleon uh, Bonaparte comes to power, uh, first as a uh, consul and then as uh, emperor. And in many ways, that's the end of the French Revolution uh, uh, to, to, to many intents and, and purposes. And then two other days, which always uh, seize historians' uh, uh, imaginations and uh, become iconic days within the uh, revolution narrative, 
And the first of those is the 10th of uh, August, 1792. It's the day on which the king is overthrown. The Tuileries Palace in uh, Paris is stormed by the Parisian uh, crowd. And a few weeks later, a republic will be uh, proclaimed. But that's obviously a very important uh, date as well. But the other date is the date that we're looking at uh, today, uh, which is, and is the subject of my book. And it is in the revolutionary calendar that's introduced in year three to, to show uh, the world that um, a new epoch of human history has opened with the declaration of the French Republic in 1792, um, uh, the 9th of Thermidor, year two. And in our talk, talk that is the 27th of July, 1794. Uh, uh, and it's a very dramatic day. It's a big day, as I say, a big day in which uh, is in, in many ways a, a turning point for the history. It certainly it's an iconic moment in the historical process of the, of the uh, revolution. And the, the um, meaning which is usually attached to it is it's the day in which not just Robespierre was overthrown, but, but France starts to move away from the system of terror, the system of uh, uh, revolutionary government, uh, which uh, in the face of war, both civil and foreign, but also in terms of the ideological changes which have got on since uh, 1789 has been transforming, uh, transforming France. So it's a big day, it's a big day, an important day, an iconic day. And I give it a treatment here in, in, my, in my book, which I think in some ways is very micro. It's a macro day in terms of its significance and my approach, and we can talk about this perhaps, is a sort of micro historical approach. Whereas um, most micro histories about uh, a place or maybe an individual, this is a slice of time, a, a slice of time. And my, my sort of thinking is that one goes down deep into the day to really understand uh, the meaning uh, and get a meaning from it, which uh, can then be scaled up uh, to understand it in the process of uh, uh, revolutionary uh, change over, the, over this decade. Um, I should say that there are three main levels, if you like, at which the uh, story is told. Uh, the first is that of Robespierre himself. You know, Robespierre is one of those characters in France, but just about everywhere else, where people hold incredibly strong views about him, and they can be absolutely anything. They can be from the extreme, you know, far right uh, and to the far left, uh, with much in between. They can be completely condemnatory and they can be completely effusive and loving him and all the rest of it. And one knows that if one's going to talk about Robespierre, one is going to get hammered by uh, colleagues. They all have their version. We all have our version of Robespierre. And so right, left and centre will probably find things to object with in my Robespierre. But that's fine. He's my Robespierre. Uh, but I, I do want to understand, obviously, what he was up to, what he was thinking. And there's a lot of debate about that, uh, uh, in fact. The second uh, um, level at which I'm looking at things is the level of the political elite within the National Assembly in which he sits uh, and their moves to overthrow him. And I tell that story in terms of, in particular, uh, the 12 uh, men who, uh, or 11 men who sit alongside him in the Committee of Public Safety, which essentially is the revolutionary government, which has, if you like, run terror uh, over the previous uh, uh, couple of years. And Robespierre has been a member of that uh, for a year. Uh, by, by 8th and 9th of Thermidor, many of those people are completely disenchanted with Robespierre. And although they're very frightened of him, actually, and that delays, uh, I think, uh, their moving against him, uh, when things get going, they are really important in the National Convention uh, in overthrowing him. What happens is that um, the Assembly, uh, the National Assembly meets, uh, it starts its business at 12 o'clock. And one of uh, Robespierre's allies, a young man, Saint-Just, a very famous guy, is going to give a big speech. The previous day, Robespierre has given a speech which has been very sweeping and very condemnatory of the government of which he forms part. Um, Robespierre, uh, Saint-Just looks as if he's going to do the same thing. Uh, and then someone comes in from, from outside, a man called Talien, who is a deputy, and, uh, and uh, dramatically um, uh, point, uh, states a point of order seizes the floor and basically launches an attack on Robespierre and Saint-Just. He, the previous night, has got a lot of uh, particularly moderate deputies on his side, so that when he does this, they start applauding. And in this very sort of spontaneous and uh, improvised way over the next few hours, Robespierre is silenced and the, and the deputies as a whole really come over, led by uh, Robespierre's uh, fellow uh, members of the Committee of Public Safety, uh, uh, to a total condemnation of, of, of him. 
by the end of that session, it's about 4 p.m. and it's been you know, going on for four, four hours. He and uh, his brother, who is a deputy, uh, a couple of other deputies, one Saint Just as well, uh, are arrested. They're sent to the bar of the house and they're put in uh, the offices of the government uh, just outside the National Assembly, which is in the Tuileries Palace, absolutely at the heart of, of Paris. The deputies, you know, having done this, they're amazed at themselves. They're amazed at their own fortitude and audaciousness, if you like. But they think it's job done, game over. We've got rid of, got rid of them. And they go off to have uh, dinner. But it ain't over yet. Far from it. And in fact, the third level, which I'm, I'm um, uh, telling the story in terms of, are the people of Paris, the Parisians themselves. Just about every Parisian there is, and there's half a million of them in, uh, in Paris in, in, at, at this time, is, wakes up on the 9th of Thermidor to what they expect to be a totally, totally ordinary day. By the end of that day, it will, they will realize it has been an absolutely extraordinary day. And not only will they re have realized it, they will actually have made it an extraordinary day. And that's Parisian input into, uh, into the, uh, the overthrow is really important. For the following reason, when Robespierre is sent out with the other deputies to the prisons around Paris, each one goes to a different prison, they don't want to keep them together. When Robespierre gets to his, which actually is the Luxembourg uh, uh, Palace prison, the Luxembourg uh, Palace as, it's, as it now is, um, the jailer, absolutely terrified at what the hell is going on, uh, refuses him entry. And Robespierre is taken off by the local police administrator who's there to the, to the Ile de la Cité, to the offices of the police administration uh, there, where he is basically there. At the same time, over in the Hôtel de Ville, the Maison Commune, <coughs> the city hall, uh, maybe two kilometers away from the Louvre and the Tuileries Palace, the, the municipal council about three o'clock has woken up to the idea that Robespierre is being overthrown. They are very Robespierreist, and the mayor, the national agent, the Agent National, uh, basically try to mobilize the people of Paris, the National Guardsmen and the people of Paris generally, uh, for a massive mobilization, a massive demonstration, which will march on the convention and basically release uh, uh, Robespierre. Now, there's lots of ups and there's lots of downs I won't go into, in, into now. Uh, but essentially, at several stages in that evening, that mobilization has been very effective. There are thousands of people outside the Maison Commune uh, all sort of, um, you know, singing the praises of Robespierre and the and the uh, uh, and the Commune. They do actually march on to a convention at one stage, although Robespierre has already gone out, so then they go back to the uh, Maison Commune. But essentially, later on in the evening, led by the convention, which uh, basically uh, acts to, to counter mobilize the people of Paris, the people of Paris stay on the streets of the city uh, and basically join the, join the convention against the uh, Commune. Uh, by midnight uh, uh, of that day, of that day, the night of uh, Thermidor, Robespierre is by then holed up in a, an a adjacent room, an office room actually, in the Hotel de Ville, sitting around with a supposed uh, uh, action committee of the Commune, uh, allegedly to, to form a, an insurrection, and realizing things have gone very, very badly, and it's not going to work out uh, for him. Uh, the people have deserted the Commune, the, the Place de l'Hotel uh, de Ville in front of the, of the Maison Commune is entirely deserted. Uh, and then just after midnight, uh, uh, two columns from the convention of National Guardsmen and other Parisians march into the place, march straight up to the Hotel de Ville, uh, up to the steps and uh, uh, take over the commune. Uh, Robespierre is in the melee, maybe by himself, maybe another person is, is, is shot uh, uh, the next day. He won't be tried because he's been declared to be an outlaw. If you're an outlaw, you just basically have to be identified and then sent to the guillotine. And the 10th of uh, Thermidor, uh, the evening, 28th of July, to much uh, Parisian enthusiasm, he is taken to the Place de la Concorde, Place de la Révolution, as it then is, and uh, is executed. Now, I said quite deliberately uh, midnight, and uh, brought up this point about midnight. At midnight, it looks all over for Robespierre, bar the shouting, quite honestly. And that's the other feature that I perhaps would draw to your attention now, and maybe we can talk about a, a, a bit more. Because I tell this story of this very dramatic day, really without the sort of conventional start that most history books have, and even the sort of conventional finish. You know, when I started this project, I was thinking, well, this will be a conventional history. There will be an introduction, there will be 
you know, the context, we'll have the sort of preconditions and maybe the causes of this, that and the other, and then we'll have the day and then we'll go on to the aftermath and the consequences and all, all the rest of it. But as I was going on with it, I realized I, did, that I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do it differently because it seemed to me to be so important what actually went on in the day and the drama of the day is really part of the, part of the story of why the day, the day actually ended the way it did, which I think in a, in a way was slightly surprising, uh, uh, in fact. So my answer to this is to tell the story in 24 hourly uh, chunks, you know, in a chapters, roughly the same length, actually. I really worked hard at this, going from midnight on the 8th and 9th of Thermidor, where I start in Robespierre's lodgings, uh, uh, with Robespierre thinking, well, that day didn't go too badly, but let's look forward to the next day. And then 24 hours later, in the Hotel de Ville there, sitting, uh, uh, you know, surrounded by people he doesn't really uh, like very much and not doing anything that he wants to do, uh, and realizing that the game is up and that uh, his life is absolutely on the line. And I think that uh, sort of a different way of telling the narrative is something which perhaps will be something which we can talk about uh, today. It poses its own challenges, of course, and I'd be happy to talk about that as indeed any other aspect of, of, the, of the book and the, and the project. Uh, great, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill in, in just one second, but I want to uh, just let you know that you know, we will be having Q&A after Bill and I give our comments and, and call and responds. And so feel free, you know, just at any time to type your questions into the chat and I'll just pick among them and, and, and leave them to call you know, much further on. But just know that that's how we're gonna do the Q&A. Okay, so Bill, uh, would you like to give your comments? Okay, uh, here again is the book. Uh, as you can see, it's quite fat. Um, Okay, I want to begin by uh, giving a sense of, um, of my experience uh, of reading this book. That is, it's a real page turner. Um, the, uh, I got my hands on the book, brought it home, um, and uh, I, I, this was back in early January. And I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to be comment commenting on this for another um, more than a month later, I'll put it aside and, and, uh, and read it later. Um, but I made the mistake of opening it up uh, and uh, just reading the first few pages. And I was completely, I was there. I mean, I had to go on reading it. So I read it pretty much straight through uh, from that time. Um, so this is, a, this is a book that's really a great pleasure to read. It's a resounding success as a piece of historical writing. Um, it's, as uh, Colin has made clear in his own comments, it's a very dramatic story about the overthrow and the death of one of the great heroes of the French Revolution, who was also perhaps one of the great villains of the French Revolution. Um, it, uh, Colin in this book narrates what was a crucial turning point in the revolution. This was an act of terror, if you will, that is eventually the execution of Robespierre that uh, brought uh, to an end the revolutionary phase generally known as the terror. So it's terror that ends the terror. Um, it was uh, one of the famous revolutionary days uh, that shaped the history of the revolution. There were several of these. Um, Colin has mentioned a few. Now, this is a very complicated story, and it's told at an extraordinary level of detail. Uh, it has a huge cast of characters uh, given by name, and, and we learn quite a bit about um, most of these characters. Um, it's based on absolutely impeccable scholarly research, um, the kind of uh, detailed scholarly research that we usually term uh, exhaustive. Uh, now, I hasten to say that uh, exhaustive research often uh, results in exhausting the reader. That is not true in this case. Um, it would have been very easy to get that bogged down in the detail, but Colin consistently makes the detail colorful, entertaining, and historically meaningful. In short, this, is, this book is really a tour de force, both as an eminently readable narrative and as a scholarly history. Uh, it will be uh, 
for the foreseeable future, perhaps forever, the definitive treatment of this cru crucial moment in the history of the revolution. It will not be surpassed. So bravo, that's, uh, that's my single word uh, about, this, uh, about this wonderful book. Um, but I have more to say. Um, first thing is, uh, the question is how does Colin pull off this kind of histori historiographic miracle of writing a book, a uh, very serious, uh, very detailed uh, historical study uh, that's also an absolutely wonderful read. Uh, well, his brilliant device uh, was to cram the whole of the story into 24 hours and breaking down the narrative into hour by hour pieces. Sometimes, in fact, uh, when we're really in the midst of things, there are a quarter of an hour by quarter of an hour pieces, but it's pretty much hour by hour pieces. Each succeeding temporal chunk um, of the story focuses on one or more Parisian location and a particular cast of characters, as well as the time span. Um, this allows him to introduce a wide range of actors and institutions, um, often uh, featuring historical uh, flashbacks. Who are these people? Where did they come from? Um, what has been their relationship to the rest of the revolution and so on? Um, so Colin uses the temporal chunks of this single day, both to push forward the narrative and also to indicate the wide variety of revolutionary experiences and situations. So let me just give a couple of examples. Um, the book opens with uh, a prelude, uh, which is set at uh, around midnight. It introduces a range of uh, typical Parisians in these revolutionary times, each in their own quarter of the city. There's a spy for Robespierre, a hapless out of work breeches maker who falls asleep on the street and is hauled into prison, the lover of an anti Robespierre politician who fears she is about to be sent to the guillotine, a militant member of a Jacobin club, uh, of the Jacobin club who frets that Robespierre has been treated, uh, treated rudely in the national convention this previous day. Um, and finally, um, an aged bourgeois who keeps a log of a daily high and low temperatures living on the south end of Paris. So through the sketches of these diverse characters, we're alerted to the variety of Parisian lives, both, uh, both political and apolitical, and also to the tense and dangerous political situation. Um, the following zero hour, that is midnight, um, chapter. This chapter is set in Robespierre's uh, lodging near the convention meeting hall. Uh, it gives us a deft character sketch of Robespierre, uh, who is presented not as a bloodthirsty brute by any means, but rather as a kind of brilliant, paranoid, hypochondriac, intellectual dandy, um, who is contemplating a new thrust against his enemies in the convention, and also in the two emergency governing bodies that uh, are currently uh, guiding the revolution. That is the famous Committee of Public Safety of which he was actually a member and also the Committee of General Security. The two of these committees did the day-to-day -day work of government um, in this uh, very perilous time of the uh, French Revolution that included uh, international warfare, revolts against the uh, Paris and many parts of uh, France and so on, and quite a lot of terror. <clears throat> uh, okay, let's see, where am I? I've lost my track. Um, Okay, um, so uh, he, he um, by, by uh, means of going hour by hour and switching locations and, and individuals he's talking about, sometimes individuals, sometimes groups of individuals, um, he gives us a wide array of characters and institutions, um, uh, deals with the two great committees and their bureaucratic burdens, 
um, does a very nice job of indicating what each of the committees does and the various uh, uh, disputes going on within them. Um, the National Convention, the Paris Municipality, the National Guard, the chock full prisons, the executed and the executioners, the sections that serve as governing committees of neighborhoods, and a host of individual characters, each in the context, context of uh, a tense and very complex unfolding revolutionary moment. So by the time you're done, you have a sense that you kind of lived through this extremely contradictory, baffling, dangerous, unpredictable, insurrectionary political moment. In short, it's a really magical piece of narrative art, and at the same time, a really great piece of historical analysis. Okay, so in addition to this, um, this unstinting praise, um, I do have one historian's question for uh, Colin. Uh, as far as I know, previous accounts of the various revolutionary days um, have really never been told in this sort of minute, personal, spatial, and temporal detail. Um, even though historians have written mountains of books about the revolution for over two centuries, um, and a number of books have been written about each of the, uh, of the days of the revolution. Uh, so the professional historian in me wants to know, how is it possible to pull off this particularly detailed story. Now, Colin, I think I remember you giving a talk about this book project a few years ago. And you said then uh, that there were a, a kind of unique archival sources that made possible this kind of minute by minute, person by person, uh, blow by blow narrative, uh, archives of a sort that weren't available uh, for other insurrections, you know, like the storming of the Bastille in uh, 1789, the October days uh, of later in 1789, um, or the insurrections that overthrew the monarchy or the one that uh, expelled the Girondins from the convention in 1793. Um, so I'm wondering if you could say something about the archives that made such granular detail um, and telling detail uh, possible in this case. Um, and I'm also wondering, why you don't say anything in the book uh, about its archival conditions of possibility. Now, I recognize that you know, one, of the, one of the ways that uh, historians bore their reading publics um, is by going on and on about archives. Um, but it occurred to me that there could have been three pages at the end that said, aha, here's how I managed this. Um, there are these are archives and these archives, and they're very particular and very detailed. Um, so I'm just wondering why, uh, why there wasn't such a four page uh, bit at the end of the book. Okay, so I've said enough or more than enough. Okay, great. Thank you, Bill, for that. Now I am going to um, talk a little bit about, about, uh, about Colin's book. Um, I'm glad that I'm glad that Colin began by on underlining the importance of the revolutionary genre, um, both in the historiography. I would also emphasize in the kind of political imaginary, the French political imaginary, there's actually a series of books, a book series that was published between 1960s, 70s, and 80s by Gary Mao. So the most, one of the most important publishers in France called The 30 Journé that made France. Um, and it's really interesting if you look at this, actually, I think what I'm gonna do is, um, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna type up, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna give you the, the link, hold on if I can do this in the chat, so you can see the list of the books. But what's interesting is that, you know, there are the usual suspects there, you know, um, the Bastille Day and, you know, um, 1848 and 1830 and things like that. But it, it seems to have been kind of generalized in some sense um, in, in this kind of collective imaginary. So, you know, you get the death of Charles the Bull, the baptism of Clovis, and the coronation of Charlemagne, which are not exactly in the revolutionary tradition of, of France. And yet, you know, one gets a sense of the domination of, of, of the, the kind of French mind in this. There's also actually a volume on uh, what's, what the Gerard Walter wrote in, in the, he calls the conspiracy of nine Thermidor 
1974. He actually died the, the year it was published. Um, apparently, writing the book killed him. It didn't kill Colin, which I'm glad to you know, see. Um, at, at any rate, you know, normally, you know, the revolutionary genre is it, it's often not exclusively a Parisian phenomenon. And I think it's wormed its way into understanding of, of, of historical progress or process to the point that the revolutionary genre becomes a, a part of the horizon of historical uh, expectation as, as a crime. This will be a transformational moment, right? Um, you know, there are two kind of senses or interpretations of this revolutionary genre, the, the, the possibility of revolution. You see, for instance, in Walter Benjamin's discussion of what he calls the revolutionary yet site, this idea of a kind of radical simultaneity of revolutionary time, a sort of mystical opening up of possibility. And on the other hand, Karl Marx sees the revolutionary genre, that political horizon, as something that only produces frustration and disillusion. You know, when he talks about the Paris Commune, he talks about this naivete of storming, this idea that you're gonna storm heaven, that, that hanging Truni hopes on um, the revolutionary genre and politics in general is what he calls the illusion of politics. For him, there's no royal road to emancipation that doesn't pass through these kind of long-term social transformations. Um, Colin's book doesn't really accept either of these extremes. And as, as Bill mentioned, as Colin himself mentioned, you know, this is an account of the nine Thermidor, as he says, the map and the clock, street by street, sometimes quarter hour by quarter hour. Um, but in a way, it kind of steers between these two, uh, these two interpretations of the revolutionary genre and revolutionary expectations in general. And there are two uh, historiographical stalking horses here as well. The first, Colin argues against the idea that the Nine Thermidor was a parliamentary conspiracy. Um, Robespierre's conspiracy theories in some sense pushed um, some others into action out of fear that they were going to be next, but it was not an organized conspiracy itself. And this is partly why Colin decides he's gonna hit the streets of, of Paris to find out what's going on outside of the confines of parliamentary politics. Um, and another interpretation he argues against, a strong interpretation he argues against, is that the Ninth of Thermidor was about something we call the terror that was, as it were, running its natural course of eating its own. And in this particular case, that the excesses of the terror led to a mass de depoliticization among the Parisian population, so that in, a, in essence, by their inaction, the people of Paris were voting for a rolling back of the radical, socially egalitarian um, aims of the Jacobin phase of the revolution and the reinstallation of this kind of bourgeois republic that one we find, finds uh, in Thermidor and the directorial regime. So in, in this interpretation of Thermidor that, that Colin is, 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 is going at, in some sense, nine Thermidor is a revolutionary genre that wasn't at all that it was not about popular politics, it was about the absence of popular politics. And again, this kind of horizon of expectation that set, sets out. Instead, he uses this, this book to reaffirm some aspects of this ideal of the genre. Popular participation mattered. It was at the heart of this event and the people of Paris protecting their revolution through popular politics. Now, I wanna ask some questions about, about that um, meaning of the event and cause, but you know, I um, I do want to kind of pause, you know, just talk in a way as Bill did, just about what a magnificent book this is. This could only have been written by an historian of Paris. You know, I mentioned that, that uh, Colin wrote a book called A Paris Biography of a City. I mean, there's plenty of parliamentary cut and thrust in this book um, between municipal and national government. Um, but Jones, you know, Colin, he makes the city come alive. And I, I think it's, it's not for nothing that he evokes in the preface to the book, the work of Daniel Roche, who wrote The People of Paris and has done these minute kind of material histories of Paris and more broadly of the Enlightenment. And also Richard Cobb, his dissertation advisor, who uh, likes more than anyone to get down into the nitty gritty. And so there's a lot of 
you know, maybe aside the politics of the situation, I, I think that readers, when you pick up the book, you will really appreciate um, some of the, you know, what seems just, it's not really just scene setting. You get a sense of the life of Paris. I think in particular of um, a passage in the book where he talks about Leal, so the, the central market in France and the Dame d'Al setting up their stalls in the market where people are going to come and get their food for the day, discussing the fish wagons coming down from the north uh, in Normandy, down the Rue Poissonnier, or the way that certain kinds of crops come from you know, the wheat fields close to Paris in the south and north, or the vineyards of Montmartre, or the cherry orchards of Montmorency, and things like that. Or he recounts at one point the distribution of pigs in the 48 sections of France. And this is a part of, of communal charity set up by the, 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 the Paris municipality. We're also, you know, I think actually the, the portrait of Robespierre, I mean, it's pretty harsh actually, that's the way it strikes me, but there's a, a one nice scene where, um, you know, uh, Colin talks about Robespierre at home among the Duplay in his boarding house. I mean, Paris is a city of boarding houses, of borders, a city of, of lodgers where a lot of social mixing goes on. Um, one might say a lot of kind of composite families are made. This is where neighborhood solidarities and, and Colin just does a wonderful job of depicting all that when he moves to the, you know, the, the political problems of the period, um, dissecting the plays that are being performed in various Parisian theaters with the eyes of a seasoned cultural historian reading between the lines to find their protests. So, you know, this is a book that could only have been written by a cultural historian who's interested in everything. And, you know, it's like he makes teeth interesting as book in the Smile Revolution. You know, he makes us, everything he touches seem interesting. So I really do suggest you, you pick up the book. You'll be drawn in, as Bill says. Um, I, I do want to ask a couple of questions about the, the, the wider claims and particularly the kind of causal aspect of it. Um, I mentioned before the idea of the terror, the role, the role that the terror plays in this. And you mentioned, um, you mentioned particularly toward the end of the book that the terror itself, terror with a capital T, becomes only retrospectively a phenomenon. You say you avoid the, the term terror or the idea of the terror as a, a historical period as an unhelpful uh, anachronism. And I think you show pretty convincingly that there's a way in which grouping together the social aims of the saint culottes um, that are embodied, for instance, in the Constitution of 1793, uh, grouping those together with the enormities, the execution uh, of all the deaths of the terror. This is a way of, um, let's say, just tarring the social ambitions of the Paris people with the brush of the, the, the terror. And so this periodization acted right after the revolution and beyond as justification for rolling back, for instance, right after the revolution, price controls, um, charity organizations. Um, so this is a way in which the, the kind of reassertion of the bourgeois character of the revolution after this, you know, what some historians would like to think of the anomaly of an alliance between the streets of Paris and the convention, how this happened by this historiographical consolidation. And it's true that later critics of the revolution pick this up. There's something um, in the nature of this, this, this uh, uh, violent radicalism attached to socially egalitarian aims, right? That these two are inseparable from one another. One finds this in Tocqueville, in Hannah Arendt, François Fire, Simon Schama. This is the trend of a lot of revisions historiography. But I want to ask Colin, is this actually a pure historiographical construction? I mean, there's plenty of, it seems, contemporary proof, you know, Barrère in 1793, he adopts the slogan of, of Paris Commune to make terror the order of the day when he proposes in the convention to adopt the law of suspects, the, the price maximum to establish the revolutionary army. Saint-Just and Robespierre, they use the word uh, proudly, in a way. And it seems to me there's a widespread understanding among saint culotte and their supporters in, the, in the, the, the National Convention that, you know, egalitarianism means social solidarity, sure, but it also entails, uh, you know, a healthy bit of social warfare as well. 
against old aristocracies, against new aristocracies, or aristocracies that are forming. And indeed, you know, it seems to me that there are some historians um, who proudly claim this link between the terror that we all know and hate and the socially egalitarian aspects of the revolution. I think of Albert Matthias, for instance, Arnaud Mayer, more recently, Sophie Vanish. Um, so maybe you could comment about that. And also, I want to ask you a bit about the, the motivations of the people of the, the people of Paris, the people of the sections who turned out finally um, for the National Convention in defense of the public to defend the gains of the revolution. And you mentioned in your book lots of strains on public opinion and in, in pub, public opinion about revolutionary elites and their institutions. I'll just mention three of them. First, you talk about um, what you call dwindling commitment to social egalitarianism. A lot of this has to do with the establishment of a wage maximum. And for those of you not so familiar with the French Revolution, there were price maximum uh, established in order to protect consumers and steer the war effort at the time. There were supposed to be wage maxima as well, um, but um, out of political prudence, these were frequently not imposed. So this led to a sort of imbalance between producers and consumers. Um, these were reimposed um, around 1794 to the great discontent of many people in Paris and elsewhere. You also mentioned what you call a general pattern of social distance, uh, increasing social distance between um, the leadership and the people of Paris. But you know, it seems to me in reading your book that the signals go both ways. This social distance you talk about is attributed to both people in the commune and, and the people in the who are living in this kind of bubble of the National Convention and the surrounding neighborhood. It's the convention itself that liquidates uh, the, the Ebertis, so the, the really uh, radical Jacobins to the left even of Robespierre. It's the commune that, but on the other hand, it's the commune that implements the wage maximum. But on the other hand, it's responsible for a lot of the charity um, uh, the charity, local charity work that the convention either cannot or will not provide. So to me, I'm, I'm not quite sure, um, you know, who's responsible for what. Um, your informants bring up the maximum a lot and you kind of swat it away, but it, it keeps coming back. Um, you know, there are other things as well. You talk about mass con uh, discontent with a kind of suppression of opinion, muffling of public opinion. I mean, who's most to blame here? It seems that there are forces um, uh, operating on both the municipal and national level. Um, there's a lot of fear and, and discontent about the terror itself, the juridical terror, people being tried and, and sent to the guillotine, and the way in which it's reaching increasingly far down in the social scale. There's more likelihood of average people being arrested and tried. Again, there seems to be a really strong invocation of communal and national government. Um, and despite all this, you say, you know, and I believe you that there's a real faith in the revolution. You had some quote um, for people listening. You write, the revolution had delivered improvements in many aspects of their everyday lives. The abolition of feudalism and the old status order, the advent of personal and economic freedoms, democratic practices, representative government, and all the rest. Um, it seems to me that before Thermidor and after, there's lots of indeterminacy about who ensures and defends the gains of this revolution, who in fact embodies the revolution at any given moment. You know, one isn't sure where is democratic will located. It seems to vary with the crisis. Sometimes saving the revolution means running against the convention, the legislative. Uh, sometimes it means defending it. The street and the Paris Commune, you know, it's, it's uncertain exactly where one is going to land in any given crisis. And so in your book, it, you know, sometimes I'm not sure what determines the judgment that only the, that the convention can save the revolution. There's lots of contingency in the account that you make. Uh, the convention ignores the strong hand it has. Um, and, and, uh, pardon me, it ignores the strong hand that the commune has when it moves against Rose Pierre in the first place. And then for its own part, the commune suffers from horrible leadership. I don't know whom you mentioned, 
of Robespierre himself. He never seems to recover from the body blow inflicted upon him in the convention early in the day. This seems really decisive. The convention is lucky to have settled on the choice of Haras to, to lead the counter the, the counter offensive. And there's a lot in your book, I think, truly, you talk about the, the, the fog of war, there's a lack of information. And Parisians, one finds all, uh, a lot of places where the Parisians are just trying to figure out where the balance of force lies, right? So they know where to place themselves. Um, and I found myself asking if the, the tide turned against the convention because the Parisian masses showed up for them, or did the Parisian masses show up because they finally learned that the tide had turned against the commune, right? And they wanted to be counted on the winning side. One thinks of all the, um, you know, one thinks of all the resistance uh, during the World War II who turned up after VE Day, right? And all throughout the book, there's a sense that there is a reluctance um, uh, to turn out for the commune. This is a kind of light motif throughout the book. So anyway, if you could you know, talk about, uh, about you know, some or all of that, I'd appreciate it. Um, I guess I'll turn it all back to you, Colin. Well, thank you both very much for those very, uh, well, very generous uh, comments. And I also very thought-provoking as well for me. And I, I, I'm very grateful for them. I'm not going to be able to answer them all, but I'll pick a, a couple up. Uh, certainly, and then we, I'd, I'd love to have question and answers as well from, from the audience. But um, I think, um, first of all, how is it possible? I have written out elsewhere on this and uh, say that basically I think this is possibly one of the best documented days in the, uh, in the revolution, maybe in the 18th century, and for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is that it is a light bulb moment day. It's like the you know, assassination of JFK. Everyone you know, thinks about it as an important day and where they were and what they were doing on those sorts of days. And that comes up and that comes up in memoirs and all sorts of things like that. Uh, but also, um, and actually like the JFK assassination, there is a government commission, uh, which like the Warren Commission, which is sent in to try and work out what happened and also to try and locate who the supporters of Robespierre were on that night so they can be uh, punished. So that becomes a, and it's a very, very detailed uh, uh, thing as well. And it's, it's enormous actually. And um, it took a lot of working through and uh, collating because it, it, each of the 48 sections has two, sometimes three, sometimes more narratives of, of, of that day and the previous day uh, as well. So you, you've got that. But also because um, not that day becomes a, a, a sort of political football for the next uh, year, what you were doing on that day can be brought up at any time when you when a, a Parisian is uh, being talked to by the police or being interrogated or whatever, or when you're writing a petition to be freed from jail or something like that. As a result of which you get literally hundreds, I think thousands actually of micro fragments, micro narrative fragments, uh, really, of the of, of, of the day. And my um, discovery of this was really important because it struck me that I had to work out a way of telling these stories, if you like, uh, in, in a way that the conventional history that I referred to earlier wouldn't, wouldn't have done. So I think the move uh, you know, in the direction of a new type of way of telling things uh, was very much uh, tied in, 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 into that. Um, so, you know, there's that sort of sense as well. I mean, the detail, um, it's interesting as historians, we all love detail and we can just pile it on, lard it on until everyone's really fed up with us. And um, in some ways, you know, the, the historian's answer what was, you know, why do you do it in so much detail? Because it's there, you know, the detail is there. It's like Everest, you know, you climb Everest uh, to, because it's there, you do the, do this stuff in close detail because it's there. But I did think, and this is where the micro historical perspective came in, that it allowed you, to, allowed me as the historian to really get into it and really to get at a much lower level and a much wider variety of people involved in, in, the, uh, in uh, what happened in the day than anyone has ever done before. And I'm certainly interested in the time, you know, the, time, the bit of time, you know, because people aren't giving a narrative for the whole day. It's very often just a, a couple of incidents or something like that but also space. This is about time and space. And what I tried to do, as I said in the introduction, is stay close to the actors, stay close to, uh, to things that are moving around the city. Could be men, could be cannon, could be news, could be rumors, could be anything. Uh, sort of, to get a sort of kinetic sense of Paris as a, as a space uh, uh, in which um, action is, is going on and people are being, uh, being involved. 
And so you can follow the course of the day by the clock, but also on the map. And I think that's a really important thing where someone is when something happens and says something has been forced into a decision. It's really, really important uh, as well. Um, so that going down very low, very at yeah, this micro sort of granular level of everyday uh, uh, life, including things which are non-political uh, as well, to give a sense of uh, the day and the dramas of the day and the changes that the day uh, produces. And for me, that was really important because, on, you know, I hadn't gone very far when I realised, in fact, that um, if you had been a betting uh, person, you would have put all your money on in the morning of the night of Thermidor on Robespierre. He was seen to be very popular. In fact, even his uh, his opponents uh, were frightened of him because of the popularity that he had within the city. He had a lot of support within the uh, 48 uh, uh, sections. Uh, his command, the commander of the National Guard was basically his, his nominee and his uh, uh, client. The mayor of Paris and the national agent who basically ran the insurrection were his appointments. Uh, and he staffed much of the Revolutionary Tribunal. He seemed to have a lot of trumps in his hand, in other words. So what I felt was that you know, it's so different, the outcome, that the, the reasons for that have to be in the day. You know, that's another thing. You're not going back and looking for you know, causes way back in time. A lot of it is actually what happened on the day. I mean, one only by this very, very close to close up sort of analysis of what's going on in the day. You'll just see things happening, just see the mood changing, the sort of people changing the, their, their minds and all the rest of it, and allowing this sort of total transformation uh, to take place. So, you know, the, 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 the volume is, I'm really lucky. I don't think there'll be another uh, day like that, which one can uh, uh, imagine providing such riches. But I wanted to use the riches in a way which uh, really got to the nub of the question of why did it turn out uh, as it did? And I don't think those things were predictable. And I think a lot of it is, is down to the day. And you know, there are, you, straight away you're thinking about issues of causality and you know, maybe causality is not a one size fits all sort of uh, model that we, we have to, uh, have to uh, use as historians. Sometimes a day uh, requires a different form of, uh, of analysis. There's so much, Paul, in what, what you want to, what you, your points you bring up that I don't know where to begin, but I, I agree with you that journée is a really important uh, uh, thing. And, and for these reasons, I, I you know, that I, I went for it because there's such a big day in, in uh, the historiography, but also in the in the history of the uh, of the day. Um, on the point about terror, funny enough, I've been talking to my class uh, in, uh, in my undergraduate class today about this uh, precise issue. Uh, so my idea is basically I'm trying to get in the heads of half a million Parisians. You know, that's the, uh, that's my that's the aim of the of the whole project. You know, what what they were thinking, which resulted in them doing what they did do. You know, so there's sort of historical construction of of uh, 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 an attitude and a change of views, if you like, over over the. Uh, over the day. So I was very, very interested in actors' categories, actors' categories. Um, but so in other words, you know, you look around what, th what terms they're thinking about. They are not thinking we are throwing, overthrowing the terror with the capital T in the way that historians talk about uh, uh, later, because essentially that is a product of the Ninth of Thermidor. It's from Ninth of Thermidor onwards, as we know, you know, it's quite well known, that, that uh, this um, retrospective uh, labeling of the period of uh, revolutionary government as the terror uh, uh, comes. So, you know, that was the reason I gave. I, you know, in the introduction, I, I made this little thing about, um, you know, writing under constraint, you know, that, which is like the Ulipo authors in, uh, the, in, in France who have this thing where you, you put a totally arbitrary constraint on your writing and see what happens. And uh, the argument of their argument is that um, a constraint doesn't shackle you, it actually frees you, it liberates your imagination. I definitely, definitely uh, found that. Uh, so sort of um, thinking in those ways through their, through their categories, if you like, is really, really important. But also, um, you know, I gave myself the task of never talking about the terror, because I thought, well, people might not notice this, it'll be a slow burner, if you like. <laughs> Sometime down the, lake, down the road, people will say, well, there's this history of the, you know, the Ninth of Thermidor, which is supposed to be about the overthrow of terror. And actually, he doesn't even mention the terror until actually in the last chapter when I'm looking after 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 the after the after the day. So I do think it's going with a very interesting set of historiographical issues here about you know nomenclature and labeling and you know actors categories and retrospective use of uh, of, uh, of words words like this. On the other hand, 
I am definitely, definitely not trying to say there was no terror. It was a te there's terrible terror. You know, there's terror, actually it's worse terror in many, many ways outside. You know, the civil war zones are where the biggest execution numbers are to be found as 2000 people are executed in Paris by the guillotine. What is also slightly in the frame as well is about half of those are in the six weeks or two months before the night of Thermidor. So there's been an acceleration, uh, if you like. But I, I think if you see it not as this is the terror you know, doing something. In other words, you take away agency from the terror, which is always a tendency when, when, when one's using the uh, term, and put agency with a revolutionary government and other revolutionary actors and other actors as well, commune or, or whatever. You get a more meaningful uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, view, I, I think. And also you see that terror is something which is not alone. You know, the it's not the absolute defining uh, feature because the other features are, first of all, to win the war, you know, the levee en masse and all the rest of it, and the mobilization of people for the army. But then also social welfare, that often gets lost, uh, completely ignored, actually. But these are radical social policies, as you say, the maximum and things like that. These are really part of the, part of the story. And the revolutionary government is a, you know, has a number of levers, if you like, repression, but also philanthropy and, of course, uh, war as well. So... I just think it's a better fit, fit really, than, uh, so I don't want to sort of, uh, you know, minimise or sanitise terror and violence and repression, because there is that. But also well, not, I wasn't trying to, I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting that you were, you were sanitising it, only that, you know, this sort of, you know, people believe that, you know, the, the terror as a kind of social, pro, like as a kind of social uh, program, if you will, and as a program of like violent political repression. I mean, at the time, people did actually think of that as a block. They, you know, they probably claim that. It's not entirely a retrospective um, fitting up of the facts. So. We can talk more, more about this, but um, certainly I want to make it a more variegated uh, picture than most, most uh, historians, I think. Yeah, I, would, I would like to point out that uh, you do a very careful job of uh, including executions of just ordinary people um, who are, for one reason or another, denounced, um, tried like that, and sent off the next day um, to be killed. Um, so so you, uh, you do have the, the actual bloodletting is a part of the story. So that's actually present here. And I thought and that I think, was... Yeah, I think the other thing, and this goes right. with Paul's point, I think, as well, is that I, one of the places that I look at, as, as you'll know if you read the book, is prisons. And we have yeah. some interesting people in the prison. Yeah. All sorts, yeah. you know, uh, counter-revolutionaries, you know, ultra-revolutionaries, radicals, non-radicals, and all the rest of it. But when they hear there's uh, uh, sort of um, stirrings in the city, uh, and even before that, they think something's going to happen, and they hear noises, they don't quite know what's going on out there they are terrified because what they're terrified of is a repeat of the September massacres. Yes. Parisian militants actually just march into the prisons and massacre half the prison population of, of, the, of, the, uh, of, of, the, of the city. So I think that sort of uh, visceral violence and that fear of violence, that fear of popular violence is really part of the terror as well. I agree with, uh, with what Paul's saying there. And it's something which is causing a lot of fear and it's terrifying as terror should, I guess it's by definition supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, okay, should we uh, turn, there aren't that many questions. I really do invite people to you know, type your questions into the chat. Um, so I'll just start um, with one. It, let me just read it out. Sundar Visu Lenvan. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your last name. Um, Here our villain granted the substantive political programs that pitted the various revolutionary factions against each other. To what extent could a wholly different uh, Girondin, I think, or no, Girardian, for me, dynamic of collective violence be discerned beneath the surface, especially if there was a general depoliticization and revolutionary fatigue among the Parisian populace? Did you get that? Sort of, I got that. Uh, René Girard. That's yeah, I, I mean, mm, I'm. I, I'm not terribly uh, convinced, actually, and I don't actually think that people of Paris is uh, exhausted or you know played out or anything like that. They're very active participants in the in in the revolution. Hero or villain? Yeah, I mean the thing about Robespierre and what I tried to give a sense of um, 
he's sort of both. I, but what I try and do in the in, in the in the um, in the in the book is to sort of see both sides. So um, Marcel Goucher has just just published a very interesting intellectual history of Robespierre, and he says he's the sort of person France, French history can't do without. You know, he's on the one hand he is this sort of social democratic uh, uh, champion and. Uh, whistleblower on power and authority and incorruptible and virtuous, all the rest of it. And he, on the other, he's the man who presides over uh, terror, at least is there when terror is uh, uh, go, going on. And I, what I tried to do is to sort of acknowledge that, you know, Robespierre has incredible standing in, in, in Paris, or has had, although I think he's losing it by, by the end, uh, for reasons which I explain in the uh, uh, book. Um, and has stood up for things which we'd all stand up for, you know, we're, all of us, you know, so in that way, it's a sort of, um, you know, he's a, he's a, a, a forefather, if you like, of a, of a sort of left, left wing opinions of our, our own day. On the other hand, this is someone with faults, with all character faults, which are so obvious throughout his life, you know, and in some ways, what is happening on the night of Thermidor is personal tragedy in a sort of Aristotelian way, you know, or Shakespearean way, I guess you'd say. Whereas the actual character faults, the deficiencies of a, a character, which have explained his greatness, if you like, are actually bringing him down at the, at the end of the day. And, um, you know, essentially, Robespierre is better outside the tent. Um, I won't go into that metaphor, sorry. Outside the political circle, if you like, criticising uh, uh, authority. What happens on the 27th of July, 1793, is for the first time in his life, First time in his life, he's never managed anything in his life before. He gets onto the Committee of Public Safety. And so he is in power. And it's a very curious thing, very sort of splits him, really. Half of him is sort of like doing the stuff of being a, a member of the revolutionary government, you know. And the other is criticizing it. You know, he's not been in for a couple of weeks when he's, he's moaning at his colleagues uh, in the convention saying they're counter revolutionists. He then gets back on stream. And then um, uh, obviously um, by the end, he. Uh, um, uh, he's again the last sort of six or eight weeks. He's just endlessly criticizing the government of which he, he forms part. And so this is a man whose who's, who's sort of greatness, if you like, is in a sort of uh, tra 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 tragic mode, is actually the reason for his, his downfall. So I wanted to do that. And of course, it is a great tragedy in some ways, following Aristotelian rules as a unity of uh, place, space, and uh, action. Uh, absolutely, the 24 hours see it, see it all happen. The other side I'm trying to do is you know, the narrative arc, if you like, is the tragic fall. But what I also try to do is the, uh, the opposite, a sort of a rise of consciousness, uh, a, a positive narrative arc of the people of Paris who basically start the day thinking a day like any other, a day, you know, there'll be people being executed in the guillotine, et cetera. But, you know, be like an, every other day. By the end, they have actually taken power into uh, their hands. They've supported the National Convention and they've changed the course of uh, French history. So I, I think I've tried to weave those two things uh, together uh, in that way. And I don't know if that's really answering your, your question. I'll leave it there for the minute. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's a question from, let's see, Devin Hoover. What was the role of Joseph Fouché in the fall of Robespierre? And what yeah, Fouché. motivated him to participate in this movement? Yeah, that Fouché is a very interesting uh, uh, character and obviously goes on to uh, great fame as the Minister of General Police for Napoleon and uh, all, the, all the rest of it. And he certainly is one of, you know, he's one of, although they knew each other in Arras, they were, they were friends. In fact, Fouché wanted to marry Robespierre's sister at an earlier stage, but then Fouché gets very involved in being a violently radical uh, representative in the, pro in the departments, forcing through uh, policies which Robespierre disagrees with uh, and also being corrupt. And so if, if Robespierre does have a list of people that on that day he wanted to get rid of, Fouché would be pretty much on the top of it. Unfortunately, we know very, very, very little about what Fouché was actually doing, apart from what he later says he was doing. And frankly, there's so much mendacity in his uh, and uh, self-promotion and exaggeration in his memoirs that I, I really discounted it. I think he probably is in the days before um, uh, uh, before the night term, or going around talking to other deputies and saying, you know, Robespierre's out, uh, kill us all, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But as I argue in the book, um, although quite a few people are doing that and a lot of people are completely fed up with Robespierre, really, 
they don't actually do much. There's a lot of hot air that's up there, but um, it's being pr produced, but very little in the way of substantial action. And I've never seen, I have not come across, I'm thinking you say it didn't happen, uh, but I, I have really, really not seen Fouché as uh, someone who is an active player. He's not one of the people who even speaks in the National Convention when there's about 30 or 40 people, fellow Montagnard, fellow uh, uh, people of uh, Robespierre's party who are attacking Robespierre. Fouché doesn't say anything. We sort of lose him, him from sight. Uh, so I don't, I, don't, I don't think his role, his agency, is particularly uh, significant for the day. Okay, we have a couple following questions. I'll ask them one by one, but it seems people are looking, they're worried that you are not going to have enough to do after having published this book. So Thomas Dobbin <laughs> asked, um, in a famous article, Bill Sewell argued that the taking of the Bastille only became the taking of the Bastille after the fact in the days that followed. It sounds like the Ninth of Thermidor happened on the spot at the time, but what would volumes two, three, et cetera, of the Ninth of <laughs> Thermidor and days after look like, and how might they change the story? You thought you're out of work, but you're not. No, I'm not doing that. I'm not, thank you, Thomas, <laughs> for setting me there, but I am not going down that, that road. But I have actually tried to sketch this out very briefly in the, at the end of the book, but also in an article that I wrote a couple of years ago in, uh, on, in, in uh, French historical studies, because you know the significance of the day does change over the next year. On the night of the 9th and 10th of Thermidor, you look in the uh, National Assembly, people suddenly realizing Robespierre has been overthrown, he's captured, he's gonna be executed. And there's this endless stream of the sections coming into the, you know, of the, of the National Guardsmen coming in for all the 48 sections. And they're, you know, receiving the accolade, the fraternal kiss of the president of the assembly and everyone praising them. And someone like Barrea stands up and said, this is a great day. This is a day where the people of Paris and the convention have defeated a, a, a conspiratorial plot aimed to uh, secure a tyranny, uh, the tyranny of, of Robespierre. A year to a day, uh, literally the 9th of Thermody, year three, so 27th of July, 1795, uh, the official report that I mentioned earlier, done by a moderate deputy called Courtois, is presented. And you look at this and you just, your jaw drops uh, if you've done the sort of work that I have on the, on the day, because basically what he says is, this is a day when the convention triumphed over Robespierre and his popular movement supporters. So suddenly there's not just an erasure of the, of the popular intervention or the popular input into overthrowing Robespierre on the 9th and 10th, which I argue is absolutely fundamental, but actually they're being put on Robespierre's side. And you can understand that, you know, because Robespierre's had a lot of popularity in the past, but actually that, that moment, I think a sort of prise de conscience of the Parisian uh, uh, popular classes that actually Robespierre is someone who's uh, leading them astray or taking them they know not where, and they'd rather hang on to the convention uh, rather than the uh, rather than uh, uh, someone who might be an adventurer, they don't know. Um, I think is 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 fundamental. So that re-narrativization of uh, of uh, of um, uh, of the Ninth of Thermidor is very important, and it you know destroys the popular movement. It's a it's a justification for taking away any sort of uh, political role that they play. Paris is totally brought under the control of the of the revolutionary government, uh, the government uh, uh, thereafter. But the sad thing is that that's what everyone has accepted, uh, that the vast amount of his historiographical work on that has basically accept that, accepted that model. And I think it's only by going back into the archives and trying to sort of dig out what was going on in terms of what people actually uh, wanted in the way that I've done, that I hope I've sort of uh, presented a, a different uh, different story. But, but you're absolutely right. We see that after a recent day in US history, which we all, we all know a little while ago, uh, and the attempted re-narrativizations of that uh, make, make, uh, make the day more than the history of the day itself. It becomes a, 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 a day which actually starts influencing uh, uh, the way in which people think about politics more generally, yeah. Well, you led Colin right into the next question by Arun Satar. I know this may be a big jump, apparently it's not, but to what extent do you see a similar micro history of other more recent events such as January 6th in the US to be written and how much distance of time may be needed for the materials to be compiled with such a deep analysis? Yes, yeah, so I'm not, I don't wanna enter into the, uh, the, the tragedies of uh, recent American and world history uh, for that matter. And I should say that the book was already done and dusted and I was on the final, you know, it was with the press really. 
when the 6th of January uh, uh, came up. But, I, well, you know, when you think about it, one, one would like the evidence. And I think uh, the uh, history of, this, of that day will be about these subsequent re I'm sure, but also will be about what actually happened on the day. And in some ways, um, uh, you know, they, 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 that's a history which, when I've sort of gone in to try and write the history of the uh, uh, night of the thermodyne, that's the way it was, you know. So it's all about causes and pre you know, and that sort of stuff, and then the aftermath. And so the sort of dayiness, you know, the dayitude of the day <laughs> got lost, you know. And even though, you know, that's really important, because I think if you squash that uh, dayness, uh, uh, it becomes too much. The day becomes just predictable, more or less sort of, you know, actors playing out something which has already been decided or already been determined by long, long, uh, long existing uh, sort of uh, determinations of one sort or another. So I didn't want to do that, as I say, because I, you know, I thought it was a day which actually did change on the day. And I think, uh, that, you know, that sort of analysis will happen for the 6th of January and for other sort of moments, uh, moments like that. And it's what I tried to do without obviously knowing there was going to be a 6th of January uh, for the for the uh, night of Thermidor. Thanks, Colin. Um, Robert Morrissey, would you like to read a passage from your book and grill you about it, I think? So, Robert? You're I'm muted, muted, Robert. You're muted. I'm unmuted now, I think. You're Hi. not muted. Okay, great. Hi, uh, Colin. Um, Hi, you, Robert. So I was, uh, I have two questions and uh, I'll, I'll ask the one I, that is, uh, that I, that you, I'd like you to answer second, but it's around um, the, the famous discourse that you described that leads to the fall of uh, Robespierre. And um, in, in one of the things, one of the points you make so well is how much he had uh, espoused the role of virtue, of disinterested uh, uh, behavior. And uh, in that evening, uh, he's trying to walk a line, uh, he's, he's trying to hold that disinterested position, but also trying to defend himself. Uh, and uh, in a way that he's against what he perceives as clear, Clearly threatening, uh, a, a clearly threatening situation, and uh, so he he actually kind of formulates a discourse of his own victimhood, you know, uh, of how I am going to, uh, and um, interestingly enough, as he tries this out, which is a way of saying, you know, I'm, uh, it's not my fault, all, all the kinds of things. Uh, it doesn't seem to have worked in the sense that somehow he, he lost his disinterested position and was forced to defend himself. And so I was wondering if you thought that played into the kind of uh, mass psychology that comes into play uh, as, you know, he, as, the, as the people uh, move to the defense of the, of the, of the convention. So that, that's one question. And then the, the question of uh, when you, talk about, and this is a tribute to your skill as a narrator, and I, this is kind of a literary question, but um, I was uh, just thinking of how skillfully you sort of uh, vary your narrative positions. <laughs> and so I, uh, on page 60, I, there's this part where uh, uh, Rob, Robespierre is going to give this talk. No, no one knows if Robespierre does indeed have a list of enemies for purging. If he does, though, Fouché must be at the head of it. He must also include Ferron and the whole cohort of the Montagnard deputy, deputies, whose profile on mission. So you're kind of carefully avoiding taking a position of whether you think that he he does have this list or, or you know how organized it is, which helps you to say to, to position yourself to say, well, there's not really a plot here. We don't, you know, he's not really if he had a list, we'd be much closer to having an, an idea. So I was just wondering, um, you know, who's speaking here? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's very, very interesting and uh, actually well spotted, I think, actually, because I think that is something which I go in for uh, uh, quite, quite a bit. I mean, if I take that second question first, um, this is a day on which people speculate, you know, what's going on and what should I do? And it looks like what I do is gonna have a big effect uh, people are thinking on their future. You know, if it all goes wrong, they 
could be, you know, they could be executed if they're in the assembly, in the national, in the streets of Paris. They could, you know, lose uh, lose authority or, you know, could be re repressed by local sectional militants or whatever. So everyone's thinking about, you know, making a decision either one way or the other. By the end, people are sort of making you know, there's a sort of snowball going on, and people are, well, I'm going to vote for the. Uh, the convention because it's winning, you know. But I think there's a general, gen, genuine moment of indecision, and basically they speculate, and I'm going to be speculating about what they're speculating about. So I'm trying to put myself into their into their heads, if you like, uh, but aware that you know there are very often conflicting accounts. I mean, on that particular point on the list, Fouché, for example, says, "Oh yeah, we had we had these lists, and we had about forty or fifty names that Robespierre was going to be." Uh, uh, going to be, um, you know, trying to uh, execute, to purge from the Assembly, sent to the Revolutionary Tribunal and guillotine. We've never really seen one of those lists. Uh, Voltaire, who Paul mentioned earlier, actually came up with a, the closest to that sort of list, but we don't know whether that's actually actually happened. Um, certainly, I think that I, you know, my my comments there are essentially um, uh, speculative, but but also, you know, I think. It's clear from his speeches in the previous weeks and those of Couton and Saint Just, his allies, that they want to get rid of some people. So, but then you know who's in it and who's on it. Uh, that is um, that is a pretty much a, a key issue. But certainly, uh, radical uh, over radical policies in the departments and uh, lack of virtue, corruptibility. Uh, and Fouché is top of the list for those. He's the person that that Robespierre you know personally marks out. Uh, for those things. So I think that's the, the sort of thing. But you also notice that I'm trying to put it as speculatively and questioning. Uh, I put a lot of interrogative form, interrogative forms, and actually a lot of question marks because we don't know, and maybe they didn't know either. Uh, so I tried to give that sense of the uncertainties of the day by using that rhetorical, rhetorical form. And the other thing which I'm sure you noticed, which I would never have thought I would do actually in any book that I ever wrote, I use the present tense a lot. I always, when historians use the present tense, I know in France it's different, but in English, it always looks a terrible pose. It looks very artificial and unconvincing. But I thought if I am trying to get into these people's heads, I've got to try and think in their terms. So using the present tense allowed me to get that sort of experiential aspect of, of, um, of decision-making and of speculating, uh, if you like, because I think people were during, during the day. On the... Uh, yeah, you're quite right. This victimization uh, language, and many historians have said, well, you know, this is um, he's um, you know self-sacrificial, and in the evening he talks about swallowing um, poison, you know, uh, uh, you're magnificently. So the self-sacrifice will be picked up by posterity and things like that. Some people have said, well, he's basically gone mad, or you know, he's he, you know, he's he wants to commit suicide or whatever. This is actually Robespierre's language. It's his signature trope. Uh, Self-sacrifice. He's virtuous, and that virtue means self-sacrifice for the uh, nation, and if necessary, laying his life on the line for the nation. It's a, a, you know, I think a lot of people around the convention, when they hear him going on like that, they think this is crying wolf. We heard this quite a lot already. He's been doing it over and over again, and I think maybe. You know, he does it once too often on the on the eighth of Thermidor because people then think, well, you know, I don't know what the heck he's going to do, and they they have a sense that he has uh, gone out of uh, out of uh, uh, control. But that discourse of victimization is something which you know ultimately at the end of the day it does him disservice because I think people don't don't believe that. He believe it. I'm not saying he's insincere. You know, I think he is. Probably lay his life down on the line but but it is because it's gone on so often you know people i think have got a bit fed up with it after a while thanks um this is a question from lily wang it's a great question actually i almost feel like asking it of your wife who is online i would like to know what it was like to live with the writing of this book <laughs> 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 what was it like to run a 24-hour narrative clock over the months, years it took to write? Is writing a temporal microhistory also a special experience for the writer? Well, I, I you know, I couldn't possibly answer. I should think a sheer pleasure, actually. I would have thought it would be high up the uh, emotional scale. But I would like to say uh, one thing, which I, I mentioned in the introduction. So at the beginning, conventional history, I'm going to write a bit. And I'm thinking, well, you know, this is... Um, 
such an unpredictable day. That's not, you know, it's no point talking about long-term causes if it's actually what's happening on the day. And then all this very rich material and everything, and you know, the sense of, you know, what matters at a time in a particular place is very important. And we were just by chance watching the TV and an episode of a 24 hour serial, you know, Jack Bauer and everything like that. And uh, so Joe turns to me and said, you ought to write your book like that. And uh, I, um, I thought, absolutely ridiculous. That's, you know, I'd never do that. So I go to bed next morning, I wake up, I think, that's a really good idea. I think I'm going to do that. I'm gonna, it's a challenge. I'd like to do that. And that's basically how I how I got onto it. And um, so I, I, she has only herself to blame, I think, is my, is my best answer to that. Great. Okay. Ollie Cusson asks, I'm only at 6 a.m. in the book, and Robespierre wakes up confident. You write, with, uh, with the people on his side, what has he to fear? This surprised me, given his famous paranoia. Why was he so oblivious to the grumblings in the street? Did his celebrity get to his head? Why did his paranoia not extend to the people of Paris? Yeah, no, I think that that's just, that's right. That's what I try and give a sense of. That uh, going into the day, he is uh, he still thinks of himself as as a player. He knows he's up against the, the he's got his back up against the wall. But in his, his in his story, to do him justice, he's often had his back up against the wall. Actually, in the Constituent Assembly, he's given a terrible time by uh, sort of sword rattling aristocrats who are threatening physical violence uh, 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 against him. Uh, and ultimately, he thinks that he has enemies in the convention, certainly. But actually, what he says to his landlord that night, and then he repeats something like it the next day, he says to his landlord, who's very worried for him, Duplay, and he says, don't worry, uh, the, most, of the, uh, most of the convention is pure. They will support me. OK, so he thinks there is a he has a chance uh, to, to, um, to, to garner support. He will be le changing horses mid-race, you know, going from the sort of left-wing Montagna position to leap over onto the moderates, which is a very considerable uh, feat, and I don't think he would have uh, pulled, pulled it off. But I think behind that, and actually it is a miscalculation, he thinks he has the people of Paris. He has had a lot of celebrity, he has had a lot of popularity, uh, and people, as I say, his, his colleagues on the Committee of Public Safety are frightened of him because they think he's too, uh, too, too uh, uh, popular. Um, and he always plays up to the people. He speaks to the popular, to the public galleries, the people in, in the in the crowd in both the National Convention and the Jacobin uh, Club. Um, and there is this sense that, and this is my sort of reading and um, you know guesswork at what I think he was trying to do. I think he was going in trying to appeal to the uh, uh, to the convention. Uh, to support him, but thinking they probably won't do it, uh, but that he will be able to use the threat of a popular uh, journée, like there was a year before when the people of Paris surrounded the National Assembly and forced them to purge the Girondin deputies. Uh, he thinks he can use that as a, as, a, uh, as a second card. So my sense of him is someone who believes in the formalities of constitutional you know, uh, rectitude, et cetera, et cetera, but if that's not working in the way that the revolution demands or that he demands, which actually he's very much an embodying the revolution type of guy, then he thinks he will be able to appeal to the people. So I think he's, he's partly, I'm giving him those words, partly giving him a sort of sense of Dutch courage, if you like, because it is courageous. But we know he had a normal morning. He, you know, we know because someone went in and uh, uh, had coffee with him and had his breakfast like normal. He leaves saying to his landlord, it's gonna be all right, don't you worry. He walks to the National Assembly with his brother. No one's, you know, and he walks into the assembly and, you know, nothing has happened. And he, he is there to be a player on, on the day, I think. Um, so, so, yeah, I think, uh, well, that you'll, see, you'll have to read beyond 6, 6 a.m., Ollie, obviously, and find out the rest of the plot. But uh, that, that would be my take on that. Uh, okay, another question about Robespierre. James Holman asks, did Robespierre have good reason to believe he could get away with refusing to read his list of conspirators in the convention? It seems like an extremely bold and overconfident move that invited all his en enemies to unite against him since any one of them could potentially have been on that list. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And that is the way that historians usually criticize or, or you know, point out about the speech on the 8th of Thermidor. It's very sweeping about the enemies of the Republic being even at the heart of government. And he instances the Committees of Public Safety and General Security, their bureaucracies, the Finance Committee, uh, lots of other people are mentioned, but in, in vague sorts of uh, uh, terms. Um, 
but he, you know he's pressed someone says well am i on your list then you know he doesn't admit he's got a list but he doesn't give any names away so this makes it easier that the next that night when talia the man who has a really important part in the uh, um in the in the in the whole day itself um uh goes around to these moderate deputies who as i say normally wouldn't give him house room actually and say you know you think you're safe you're not robespierre's lost lost track you know he's gone wild we just don't know now how, how much uh, is going to go on he and particularly couton his closest ally sometimes ventriloquizes robespierre in the jacobin club are saying we don't want a big purge we only want five or six people um, uh, and probably Fouché would be on that list, I think, actually. But, but because it is so vague, one does wonder, you know, whether he thinks that uh, and that would be sufficient, five or six, and it'd frighten everyone else off. You know, and that's a tactic that worked with the, with the Giron there, where they took out 22. Um, so um, uh, it's, difficult, it's difficult to say. Um, but I think he, what's going on in his mind is that he's trying to regroup and to, and as I say, change horses so that he will get enough support from the moderate, <clears throat> even right wing members of the, of the convention who fear the far left more than they fear, uh, they, they fear him. So it's not, you know, it's, 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 he's wrong actually. And uh, in, the, on, in the day, one of the things which makes it um, a fateful day for him rather than, um, uh, than the other days is that um, he doesn't really get the me his message across to the people of Paris. Um, before the sections have acted as a sort of uh, uh, mouthpiece of his ideas, the sections are much more under the government control now. They're not actually really supporting him in that way. He thinks the Jacobin Club can do that work for him, but actually it can't. It doesn't. The Jacobin Club even is fairly divided, in, in, in fact, on this. So, you know, he gets the calculations all wrong, uh, but I think that's what he is going in thinking, actually. Okay, great. Um... Ada Torres asks, uh, Professor Lucas, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what did you learn about Paris that you didn't know before writing this book? Yeah, that's a good uh, question, because I did, you know, I totally, um, yeah, what I wanted always to do was to see where something was happening, and I was always looking for all these sections for places that I knew or didn't know or that seemed to be, to, to, to be different. Um, and I guess I read a lot of stuff which would give me a sense of daily life, just normal life in late 18th century Paris. I, I say in the introduction, I use uh, Louis Sebastien Mercier, Tableau de Paris, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful read, but which really is a book that's written about what it's like walking around the streets of Paris with a sort of political awareness, uh, uh, if you like. So I, I learned all that sort of stuff. But I also was very, very keen to know where places where which are no longer there. And um, I, I made a lot of use of the uh, famous two volume dictionary of the streets of Paris by Jacques Hilleret, who gives you like a history of all the, you know, anyone who was famous who lived in that street and what number they were and what it looked like and everything like that. In Britain, we have this, uh, this radio program, there's an island discs where they have some sort of celebrity and they're, they're allowed, they're cast away on a desert island, and let, you know, in their minds. They're allowed to take like 10 records or eight records with them, but their favorite records. And they're allowed to take one other object, one other book. They're allowed to take Shakespeare, the Bible, and one other book. I would definitely take Jacques Hilleret because I learned so much about Paris by leafing its pages, uh, as well as then, you know, wandering the streets to try and find out the traces that are, that are left. Um, okay. Oh. Let's see. Okay, well, I have one final question. Uh, Dylan M. asks, is there an unanswered question about the day that, in the absence of conclusive historical evidence, nags at you even after writing this book? What a nice question. Well, I think the big speculation is, as we'd all said, what did Robespierre really want? What, did it, what was he after? And, uh, you know, it's going to be a question that's incredibly difficult to answer for two reasons. One of them is that what we know about his ideas is through his extremely copious speeches, which have been published, and his writings, his correspondence, uh, uh, and, his, and his journalism uh, as, as well. And yet, one of the characteristic things of this day is he says nothing. Uh, what they what they realize in the National Assembly is that um, um, they can keep him quiet, and that if he's quiet, 
he will not persuade anyone. He won't persuade the public galleries. He won't persuade those deputies who are frightened of him to come that way. So he expostulates and he turns around and calls the, the president of the assembly, uh, you know, president of the assassins and, uh, you know, various other sort of expostulations. He says nothing. He says one or two things in the course of the, uh, of the day. But for me, again, one of the remarkable things is that when finally he's moved from the Isla La Cite, the police administration, to the uh, Hotel de Ville, which is about 10 p.m., he goes in and there's like, everyone's cheering there. There's big crowds still in the, in the main uh, chamber there, 10 o'clock at night. They're all going to go later. But he says virtually nothing as far as we can see. He might make a short speech. His brother actually speaks a lot more than him. And Robespierre goes off into a quiet uh, room where, they, where the sort of committee, the action committee for the, for the insurrection is, is taking place. And it would appear he doesn't really have much to say. We don't know exactly because nearly everyone sitting in that room was executed in the next uh, uh, two days. So it's, uh, you know, the most uncharacteristic uh, sound uh, coming up from uh, uh, the absence of sound coming from Robespierre's mouth in contrast to his, uh, his uh, uh, very voluminous uh, speeches and uh, journalism, I think, which poses the big problem. And that's the task for us as historians to try and work out what did Robespierre really want. Okay, great. I, I guess, you know, we've come to the end of our 90 minutes. So I most of all want to thank Colin, but also Bill and 3CT Center um, for hosting this. And also thank you to our audience for coming and asking questions. Um, oh, see you soon. And thank you on my behalf to everyone as well involved. And thank you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Paul and Bill as well.